Hey friends, it's Josh, and for this week's SYSK Selects, I've chosen What Makes Lead So Poisonous, our 2016 episode that was recorded around the time of the Flint water crisis, which apparently is still going on, sadly. This episode is one of those ones that's filled with science, culture, history, all that stuff, so I hope you really like it. It's a good one. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark with Charles W. Chuck Bryant and Jerry's to my right. So this is Stuff You Should Know. That's right. Recording in a new pop-up restaurant called Jerry's Burrito Shack. Yeah. (laughs) Jerry's eating a burrito right now. A frozen one, I guess, right? You didn't make that from scratch fresh, Jerry? Frozen burrito is fine with me, though. Yeah, some of them. Nothing wrong with any frozen burrito ever created. Yeah, I mean, there's this, they're very specific, you know. I mean, it's not like a, a fresh burrito, but it, it's its own thing that's still right. good. Right. They should call it like a burrito or something weird like that. Something to differentiate <laughs> it, you know? I agree with you, man. Yeah, but man, sometimes when that uh, refried bean pops out and burns your mouth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's just the best. And you have a hole in your in your on your gums for a couple of days. Yeah, I'll throw a little cheese on top too to uh cool it in the oven. No, to melt on top. Oh, that's an enchilada then. Uh Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I think the enchilada makes the it's the sauce, right? Yeah. Okay. That's what I'll say. Yeah, Swimming in sauce. All right, enchilada sauce. This may be your best intro yet. Ole. <laughs> uh Chuck we're talking about lead today. That's right. Do you know much about um, the uh, Flint, Michigan lead poisoning scandal that happened? I a should bit. say blemish. Yeah, I, I posted about it on our Facebook wall uh, a couple of months ago and sort of was a part of a lively discussion there, but um, mm-hmm. only from that and then this research. Yeah. Same here. I mean, I was aware of it, kind of. I didn't understand the details. Yeah. But for those of you who don't um, who don't know about the Flint, Michigan water poisoning, but Flint, Michigan um, has uh, faced a lot of problems since the auto industry went away. Um, but one of them wasn't poor water quality. They actually, the people of Flint actually paid, I think, the highest rate or among the highest rates in the country to get their water. Their water was pumped from Lake Huron through Detroit, and Flint bought their water from Detroit. Yeah, get that good, clean Detroit water. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know you're in a pickle when you're buying water from Detroit, and that's the healthy water. Yeah. So um, they're building a new pipeline from Lake Huron that goes around Detroit, and Flint said, we're going to get in on that action. And Detroit said, oh, yeah, well, we're canceling our contract. Rather than pay for a short-term contract with Detroit – the emergency manager, the basically the the emergency mayor appointed by the governor himself, yeah, um, said we're just going to tap into the Flint River. Yeah, not not a good idea as it turned out. No, it's not because in Flint, Michigan, there were among other places something called uh, Buick City. Yeah, Buick City was a four hundred plus acre um, car manufacturing plant that made Buicks, and um, it really heavily polluted the river. Yeah, so much so that. People in uh, Flint, after just a few months of drinking this water from the tap, started losing their hair. Um, well, right away they said, this looks and tastes awful. Right. It tastes of chlorine. And yeah. the reason it tasted of chlorine is because there were E. coli break outbreaks yeah. that they had to, like, treat the water with, with chlorine. chlorine. Yeah. And then it also, to some people, um, it smelled like uh, sulfury as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. It looked terrible. But people started losing hair. Started getting rashes. Yeah. Um, there's There was one kid who uh, had an autoimmune disease already. He just stopped growing. Yeah. Um, and it was it was bad news. But the people of Flint, the Flint government and the, the Michigan Environmental Protection Division basically said, nope, we're following all the laws. Um, everything's fine with the water. Just go back to sleep, Flint. And Flint did something different. A bunch of them taught themselves the science of, like, water and yeah. sanitation and um, d- the drinking water laws. And they became basically citizen scientists, and they took it back to the Flint government and the state government and said, you guys are wrong. This is toxic water, and we're being poisoned, and you have to do something about it. And they finally did. Well, um, and I think the issue was, don't play dumb. We know you know. Like, right. why, why are you making us tell you? Exactly. 
And they kept the, – apparently the company line was, no, the, here's the science. Here are the, here are the results of the yeah. tests. But the tests were terrible. And if you want to know all about it, there's a really, really great um, article on 538.com called What Went Wrong in Flint. And um, it just really chronicles everything very well. But the, the big problem with Flint isn't that there was chlorine in the water. It was that there was a bunch of lead in the water. Yeah. And the reason why there's a bunch of lead in the water is because there's lead pipes going to a lot of houses in Flint, and the water that was being pumped through those pipes was so corrosive that it was bringing a bunch of lead with it and poisoning the city of Flint for months. Yeah, and the reason people use lead in pipes is because it's not corrosive. Corrosive. That's how corrosive so, the water was. Yeah, exactly. That really says something. It really does. Uh, and I guess we'll loop back later and talk about the lawsuits and all that stuff. Sure. That sound good? Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Kind of bookend it. But let's talk about lead itself. Like, what's the problem with lead? Where did it come from? And that, that whole idea of um, using lead pipes is nothing new either. It's actually pretty old, to tell you the truth. Uh, yeah, lead, um, well, the Romans, of course, were the... The first to do almost everything, either Asians or Romans. Sure. Um, well, I don't know. Africa. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah. So basically Should everybody <laughs> except except Europe as the uh, migration expanded. Yeah, exactly. And don't forget all of the innovations going on in Mesoamerica as well. Shout out to anyone who came before us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it's been going on since ancient times, Romans using lead as lead piping. Uh, for sewage uh, draining and carrying water. They even stored water in containers lined with lead. Uh, and in fact, this is pretty interesting, I think. The English word for plumbing mm -hmm. and the chemical symbol, PB, that is lead, comes from the Latin word plumbum. Now a plumbum is, is that plumber's crack? <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> if it wasn't, it is officially now. You know, my friend Eddie, he, uh, his young daughter asked him what plumber's crack was the other day. Oh, really? And he said, I said, what'd you tell her? And he said, well, I, you know, I told her what it was. He said, sometimes plumbers, they bend over a lot because pipes are below you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes their pants sag a little, then you see their butt crack. Yeah. And she went, oh, okay. The only <laughs> thing I take issue with is the use of the word sometimes. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> All the times. Other than that is a great explanation. Uh, so the Latin plumb bum, uh, which means lead. Yeah, which that, that has been mysterious to me for many decades, PB doesn't make any sense. Like, why would they call it PB yeah, if it's, it's peanut butter. lead? Right. And PB is, uh, you'll find it on the periodic table, and the reason you'll find it on the periodic table is because lead is an element, a heavy metal, um, and it has all sorts of properties that make it very desirable. Yeah, really unique, too. Although super, super toxic, <laughs> as we'll find. Yeah, it's not often you can find uh, something that is super malleable and yeah, soft, but right. also strong and dense. Exactly. Um which makes lead perfect for uh, water pipes. Yeah. Because it's also it also resists corrosion, like you said. Mm -hmm. So you can run water through it, and as long as the water's not super bad, uh, the the lead won't rust. It will leach lead into the water, but it still won't rust, right? Right. So um, it's also uh, not very good at conducting electricity, which makes lead very useful for other things like um, soldering electrical connections. The electrical connection will remain the thing that transmits the current. The lead won't. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Did you say soldier? Solder. Solder? Yeah. Never heard it pronounced that way. How do you say it? Solder. A solder. You got to say that L. The may, I think the L silent, unless it's regional. So Maybe regional. Regional to my brain, <laughs> I think. Solder. You say that because you're from Toledo. Right. <laughs> so the use, of, uh, the use of lead goes back even before the Romans, actually, but it first appeared mostly in art, like lead paint. Yeah, it wasn't like, um, it was. Uh, they describe it in the article as a novelty, uh, and it was, apparently it makes colors more vibrant, mm -hmm. uh, and it's less corrosive, which is why you still, even in the United States, see lead paint on um, street signs, because it's less corrosive. There's not a Oh, band. really? Yeah, that's what they say. It's still used on signs. Supposedly... Up until as recently as the 90s, and it may still be going on depending on the country that it's produced in, the ink on the outside of a plastic bread bag frequently has lead in it, or it used to. Really? And it wasn't a problem unless the, somebody kept the bread bag and turned it inside out to store food in. Then that food leached the lead out of the ink. Oh, wow. It was actually like a, a big problem for a while. Huh. 
Well, but that, uh, I'm not sure that it is anymore. I couldn't find anything right. recent. The most recent thing I saw was 1991 saying that, yeah, it still happens. Right. Well, it's less expensive as a paint, which is another reason. Uh, and the and the colors are more vivid, apparently. But um, this hasn't been a problem in the U.S. for a while. But in China, uh, they still use a lot of lead um, in paint. Uh, and in 2007, there were massive recalls for everything from Dora the Explorer toys to Sesame Street toys due to the fact that they had uh, lead paint on them and little kids put everything in their mouths, yeah. including their toys, because uh, they're big dummies, and they end up eating lead, uh, which is a big problem. So there was a massive recall of uh, Chinese products in 1997 yeah. because of this. It's, no, it was 2007. What did I say, 97? Yeah. You were hearkening back even <laughs> further to the uh, Urban Dance Squad day. <laughs> yeah. Did you look them up? No. Oh, man. You're missing out. I don't think that's true. Really? Yeah. Why? Just because I like them? No, so no, they no, can't no. I remember them vaguely. <laughs> oh. Yeah. It wasn't like I'd never heard of the Urban Dance Squad. No, you have good taste in music. Mental Floss for the Globe. Great. Like a legitimately great album of the All right. I'll look it up. Yeah. <laughs> I'll look it up. It's just weird that you would say you think you're not missing out for no, no reason. No, because, I mean, again, I remember Urban Dance Squad. For some reason, I put them in line with, like, Spin Doctors and 311. No, no. Well. You know what I mean? 311 could be slightly compared because they were kind of a rock rap group, uh -huh. but they were Dutch. Urban Dance Squad was? Yeah. Oh, okay. So that, that makes them cool inherently. Right, automatically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Somebody who just picked this up is like, <laughs> what are they talking about? I know. Enchiladas, Urban Dance Squad. Um, so lead paint in the United States is, uh, well, it's still an issue in some ways because older houses still have it. But yeah. as of um, 1978, they said, no more. Get the lead out. That's right. And they define it as uh, any paint or uh, surface coating that contains lead equal or exceeding one milligram per square centimeter. Yeah, so basically um, in 1978 they said if you're going to manufacture something for somebody's home that people are generally going to come in contact with, most people don't come in contact with street signs. Yeah, um, that's the deal. Right, then you can't have lead in it. But again, any house built pre-1978, and there's plenty of them out there, oh, yeah. very likely has lead paint. In it, it also probably has lead pipes. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of lead around us all over the place. In places you wouldn't even think, like there's lead in uh, leaded glass. Like a gla <laughs> no, really, like a glass you, like you might be using, you conceivably could be drinking lead out of it. Oh, but you don't drink out of leaded glass. Sure. They, yeah, they, they use it to make regular plain old dumb glass into more like crystal. It gives it like a ping when you when gotcha. you tap it. It makes it uh, the col the um, reflection a lot sharper. It also um, lowers the melting point. So you know if you put it in the oven, it doesn't like bleh. right. But it's conceivably bad for you. Uh, you know who was on it long before the United States government, federal government, was the city of Baltimore. Uh, in 1951, they banned lead pigment for interior paint. Very smart uh, for their housing and. Since the 50s, it had kind of been phased out in different parts of the country. Uh, and then in 1971, we finally got the Federal Lead Poisoning Prevention Act. And then it took seven years after that to fully ban the paint. The paint. Lead paint. Right. There's another big source of uh, lead that was all over the place in the 20th century. Uh, and that was in gasoline, in cars. There was an additive in uh, gasoline that was added to gasoline called uh, tetraethyl lead, right? Yeah, you remember that. Like, uh, you know, fill it up with unleaded or, right. or, or fully leaded. Right. And the reason that they added lead to gas was because there was a problem called knocking, right? Where um, the, uh, in a high-performance engine, when the gas entered the um, ignition chamber, the combustion chamber, it it may just get so amped up that it would combust, it would ignite before it was supposed to, and this would um, basically disrupt the movement of the pistons, right? So and when they did that, pinging. they knocked, they pinged, it did all sorts of bad stuff. The lead kept the uh, gas from combusting or igniting before it was meant to, so it was a pretty great additive. The thing is, we already knew that lead was not good for you at the time, but we added it to gas anyway. And then it was finally phased out in the 70s, 
starting in the 70s, I should say, um, because we started adding uh, catalytic converters to our cars. Yeah, that helped. Uh, that and um, just our, our, the process of the chemical process of refining petroleum just advanced, so we no longer needed it. Right, so it wasn't just crummy gas. It was pretty good gas. It didn't need lead. Yeah. If you run leaded gas through a catalytic converter, it totally messes it up. And the catalytic <laughs> converter is there to prevent emissions, so you take lead out of gas. The problem we found is that during these um, few decades, from like the 20s till actually 1996, was the last year you could have lead in your gas in the United States. Yeah. 1996. Um, that during this period, basically all the cars on the road were spewing lead, lead vapors into the atmosphere that would just go into the air and then come back into the ground and settle in the soil and water and your face. Yeah, I had I used leaded gas in my, um, I had to put it in my early VW Beetles that I drove. Oh, yeah. I had a couple of old, you know, vintage, well, not vintage, they, we bought them new. Oh, yeah? Yeah, my mom, she bought a 68 Beetle brand new. Wow, that's neat. And that's the one I drove when I turned 16. Wow, I think it was still around, huh? Yeah. Yeah, nice. I, you know, those things... They never die if you take care of them. Did you, like, ever use duct tape or anything like that on it? (laughs) No, but I did. uh, Funny you mentioned. uh, I had a hole, sizable hole in the rear floorboard um, that uh, we, my friends call it the Flintstones car because you could, like, (laughs) put your feet down and run. That's awesome. Uh, So I did have a board. A running board? Um, No, just a board over the hole. But, I mean, you you could remove the board and run (laughs) while you were sitting in the back seat. That's right. Great car. Yeah. Uh, lead has been added to cosmetics over the years, uh, ju- jewelry, uh, pottery. And <laughs> then uh, today, because everyone knows lead is so uh, such a jerk, one of the only places you're going to find it in the U.S. at least is in uh, your car battery. Your car, yeah, your car battery or your laptop, actually. Yeah, which is why it's really important to recycle that car battery. Don't Or that laptop. Don't throw it in the woods. Yeah, responsibly... Recycle your electronics and batteries. Yeah, if there's one thing that we've learned since the 20th century is that lead has some serious staying power, and it has a the a very pesky tendency to get out of wherever we put it, right? Yeah. And, it, yeah, if you put it in just a regular landfill that's not designed to accept things like lead, um, it'll just leach into the groundwater. Mm-hmm. And um, same thing with your e-waste, your uh, your laptops. And the reason that we they're used in laptops um, is because <clears throat> the... Lead actually protects you from the radiation that would shoot out of your laptop <laughs> screen into your face. Yeah, if it weren't for the toxic lead in there. That's right. Uh, glass cathode ray tubes, uh, like you find in your computer uh, laptop screen. Yeah. Well, I don't know about your laptop. But your computer. Yeah. Your, your monitor. monitor. Yeah. I bet there's. But is you there should lead in there. You should responsibly recycle your laptop too. For sure. For a number of reasons. Yeah. I know you did a uh, what was it called? Electronics recycling. Yeah. What was it? Like just a thought or. I have no idea what you're talking about. You did a video series where you, like, narrated. Oh, sure. Uh, Deep Thoughts. <laughs> no. I can't even remember. I created the series. Yeah, but you did one on e, e-recycling. Yeah, but nobody right. cared or watched, so. The world was not saved. Everyone said, Chuck, quit doing it. Uh, all right, well, let's take a break. I'm going to go cry a tear for, uh, <laughs> man, what was the name of that series? I don't know. We'll go get 40s and pour some out on the curb for them. All right, we'll be back in a sec. All right, Josh, we've talked a lot about lead so far and enchiladas. Enchiladas. In Dutch rap rock, rap rock bands. Yeah. Lead comes from the earth, though. Let's, let's take it underground. Yeah, it's not actually, I mean, it is naturally occurring, but it doesn't naturally occur in its pure form. Yeah, you don't just like dig down and you're like, hey, there's a big hunk of lead. Right. Let me pull it out. Instead, lead atoms have, um, I think, four unpaired uh, electrons, maybe? In its outer shell, um, so it likes to form connections with other things. So when you find lead in the earth, you're going to find it in the form of a um, oxide or a sulfide or something like that. Frequently, it's combined with silver, and so that means it has to be separated. And even the Romans back in the day, which by the way, these Roman um, lead pipes that yeah. they used for baths and for sanitation and stuff, 
still intact today. Yeah, you can still dig those up and beat people with them. You could. They're so strong. That's the other place you'll find a lead pipe is in the hand of some dude coming at you. Yeah, or a game of Clue. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was bent even. The guy was hit so hard with it. Yeah. Colonel Mustard, he was not to be trusted. <laughs> he was not. Uh, but, yes, the Romans, uh, they had a pretty ingenious – man, they were so smart. They had a pretty ingenious process uh, called cupellation. Uh, the extent of that is basically the idea is that some precious metals – I'm sorry, precious metals, all precious metals uh -huh. won't oxidize, but dumb metals will. So if you heat that junk up, it's going to separate. Right, and that, they used it mostly to separate from silver, but these days we get most of our lead from um, something called galena, where a lead sulfide is found, right? Yeah, and our process is sort of similar. It is, in, very similar. Like using heat to separate things. And this this actually it very much resembles, do you remember our... Um, uh, waste gasification episode. Yeah, I couldn't remember which one this evoked. Uh, it was that evoked. one. Yeah. It was that one. Um, because the process is very similar. So you take some uh, lead sulfide and you heat it up uh, in the air. So there's the presence of oxygen. And it converts into um, lead oxide and sulfur dioxide, right? So yeah. you separate them out a little bit. Then you take that uh, lead oxide and you add carbon, coke, and you, again, mix it with some air. And as that happens, the air combines with the oxide into car – no, the carbon combines with the air and becomes carbon dioxide, takes all of the um, oxygen molecules from the lead atoms. So the lead, basically what amounts to pure lead, becomes molten and goes down to the bottom of the furnace and carbon dioxide – goes out into the atmosphere. It sounds like a very uh, safe process, basically. Yeah. You're creating molten lead and carbon dioxide. Yeah, that's called roasting and smelting. And uh, once that lead sinks, uh, cools down, it's, gonna, it's called a pig. It's just a big mess of lead, basically. Yeah, like pig iron. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's delicious. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, and then you have slag, which is uh, the non-metallic byproduct of the smelting process. Yeah. And uh, you siphon and cool that down, and it's waste uh, waste product. Yes. Uh, and like I said, recycling your car battery is important because there's also a process called secondary extraction where they get that lead out of your battery because right. you can keep using it. Exactly. That's the other good thing about lead. It is extremely reusable because, again, it, it, it has a lot of staying power. So you're not going to use lead up. Right. You know? Yeah. Which means you want to reuse it. Yes. We should get to the point where we don't need to mine any more lead or process any more lead. Just reuse the lead we've got. Yeah. Or maybe find some great substitute that isn't so toxic, you know? Yeah, melt down those uh, tiny Civil War figurines. Oh, yeah, those guys are... Are those similar. lead? Sure. Okay. I yeah. thought they were. Yeah. So handling and painting those with lead paint, it's dangerous, right? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. Is that why we're losing so many Civil War figurine buffs? I think so. At an alarming rate? That's why uh, they all have, like, spittle and drool around the corners <laughs> of their mouths and, like, zone out while they're painting. Well, there's other reasons for that, but sure. <laughs> it contributes. So, uh, okay, Chuck. Um, you mentioned, or we mentioned, lead uh, refining and processing, smelting, roasting, that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, that does create emissions of not just carbon dioxide, but also um, lead vapor, yeah, which is not good stuff. And you want to control that kind of stuff, but it is emitted. And it, uh, it used to be, well, these days, lead emissions um, from refining and processing are actually the number one source of lead vapor emissions in the environment, right? But um, 40, yeah, about 40 years ago, 45 years ago, that was not the case. The case was all of those cars driving around on the streets yeah. emitting lead vapor. Yeah, it used to account for about 78% if it came from your automobile. And uh, since the, the phasing out and reversal, we now have 52% coming from uh, the, uh, the processing. And what is it down to uh, road sources? I, it's 13%. Uh, 13%, 13 yeah. from fuel combustion? Not bad. No, not bad. Still, again, you basically want it at there. like zero. As yeah. we're finding, like the um, as we'll see, the the lead exposure in any amount is not good, and it gets it goes from not good to really bad very quickly. Apparently, yeah. And uh, you know, lead is no good. We mentioned uh, kids chewing on something with lead paint is not good. If you're redoing your house, uh, and it's pre 1978, uh -huh. you want to get a piece tested. You can't just be like, oh, let me sand off. 
No. The the paint on this uh, molding. No. Because again, even if you think you've cleaned it up, there's you still it in. there's lead right there, buddy. Yeah. Um that you're not going to get rid of it. Apparently also opening and closing your windows in a pre-1978 house can create lead dust. Yeah, if you're lucky enough to be able to open your windows. Sure. That's a that's a point. Mine are sealed shut. Yeah, or nailed shut or what have you. Yeah. Yeah. Just from years of painting basically with probably lead paint. Guaranteed. No, it's not, actually. We, we had it tested. Oh, did you? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't 100% lead paint. But you had it tested, like, all the way through, like... Whoosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is pre-1978, it's not I, like no, that's the only paint that was used. I know what you're saying. That's why you get it tested. Right, but did you get, like, all the layers underneath tested? Well, for any... Yeah. Okay. That was my... Whoosh. All, yeah, yeah, all yeah, the yeah. layers sound effects. Like we hired a lead person. I got you. Good, good, good. That makes me feel better. Yeah, and if you want to, if there is lead and you want to get the lead out, you're going to have to hire someone that knows what they're doing. And oh, they'll, yeah. They'll come in with their hazmat suits on mm-hmm. to do so. Right. Um, so you can also get it from plumbing, although apparently um, with lead plumbing, it's not quite as much of a threat as you would think. You know, doesn't that make you just want to like never drink water again, knowing that you have lead pipes in your house? You shouldn't necessarily be worried because um, over the years, uh, water sanitation experts have f- figured out that if you have good water that's non-corrosive, it actually is not only non-corrosive, the water will leave behind a protective coating that coats the inside of the uh, pipes oh. that it runs through. Over the lead? Yes. Nice. Over whatever it is. But yeah, it's yeah. going to leave a protective coat of um, other substances that aren't toxic. It's going to form a barrier for later water and the pipes. Right. Um, and uh, so you, you shouldn't necessarily be freaked out if you have lead pipes coming to your house. Although, right. I mean, if you got the money, there's, there's definitely worse things you could spend your money on than replacing those pipes. Yeah. You know? Move to what? Copper? PVC? Well, copper can be a problem as well. There's actually a copper lead rule that, um, that dictates how non-corrosive a city's water has to be right. to follow this rule. And it's protecting not just against lead, but copper. You don't really want copper either, although it's not nearly as bad for you as lead. Interesting. Uh, so if you have lead in your system, I mean, it goes, it goes into your bloodstream. Uh, doesn't matter how it gets in there. If you inhale it, it'll uh, be absorbed through the capillaries in the lungs mm-hmm. into the blood. Or if you, uh, if you, if you lick it. touch it, if you lick it, yeah. <laughs> it's going to find its way into your blood. Uh, and you can, I mean, it's really easy to find out if you have lead in your blood. You just get a blood test. Um, I don't know why they would do this other test. I don't either. And not just a blood test unless it's, like, prohibitively expensive or something. So, the, yeah, the other test is called the zinc protoporphyrin um, test. And that's a byproduct of red blood cells as they break down in the presence of lead. So rather than directly testing and, it's and not finding lead, either. you're like going around to see, uh, excuse me, lead, uh, I want to see if your shadow yeah, is detectable. I don't get it. It makes zero sense. Because you got to take your blood for that too, right? Sure. And it's not as accurate. Yeah. doesn't make any sense. But, but the, the lead blood test is so easy that um, companies like 3M and plenty of others sell home lead blood tests. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. It is nice unless you're the parent who is freaked out giving one to your kid. Well, that's true. You know? Uh, Anything over equal to or greater than um, five micrograms per deciliter uh, is bad if you're a kid. Uh, If you're an adult, you can tolerate a little bit more, but it's still distressing. Right. And that's how it's expressed. So um, a microgram to a deciliter, which is what, a tenth of a liter, right? Sure. Um, And so five is not good. Ten micrograms in a deciliter is where demonstrable, um, like behavioral and cognitive problems start to to develop. Yeah, that's serious trouble. But the EPA has said um, that there is, quote, no demonstrated safe concentration of lead in blood. Like, you shouldn't have any in you. Right. The problem is... Because it's nothing but toxic to humans. There is no benefit. Yeah, and um, we'll talk about that in just a second. But the, the problem with lead is that we're figuring out that we shouldn't be exposed to it at all while we're also simultaneously figuring out that we have awashed our planet in it. Yeah. From the last, like, couple hundred years, basically. Yeah. You want to take a break? Yeah. All right, we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, all kinds of fun stuff. (laughs) 
All right, so before I left, I teased that there is no function for lead in the body. It is nothing but toxic. Uh, and it, the way it behaves in your body in a, a negative way is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, your body, and this happens a lot. I feel like we covered the body mistaking something for something else quite a bit. Yeah. Is there, there should be a word for that. Uh, case of mistaken identity. <laughs> I guess that's it. Uh, but the body treats lead like calcium. Um, so it's going to go where calcium goes in the body, including your bones, mm -hmm. which is super scary. Yeah, lead settles in very comfortably into calcium receptors. And it's not just bones. Like, that's what I always think of when I think of calcium. Yeah. Like, well, you need calcium because your bones will break or you'll right. get rickets if you don't have it or whatever. Um, but calcium comes in handy throughout your whole body. And one of the big places it shows up is in calcium ions in um, your neuronal activity, right? Yeah. So when your neurons fire, one of the ways that they fire uh, is because the neurons or the calcium ions get them all excited and then boom, your, your neurons is fired. If lead is in that calcium ion channel instead of calcium, that boom doesn't happen. And all of a sudden your neurons aren't firing as much as they would if the lead wasn't present. And now we have a big problem here. Yeah, and it's especially a big problem with children um, because... Children's little brains are, uh, you know, we've talked about plasticity before. Mm -hmm. They're constantly forming these new neural connections. And any kind of lead in the, uh, mistaken for calcium is going to disrupt those connections. And so y your child is literally, their brain isn't going to advance like it should. Right, exactly. Intellectually, um, the apparently emotional centers like the amygdala can suffer. Yeah. Um, the, it's been found to uh, produce hyperactivity, antisocial behavior, um, attention deficit disorder, uh, all sorts of problems from the presence of lead, right? Um, and it, like you said, it's worse for kids because their brains are still developing and forming. It's bad for anybody, but it's definitely worse for kids. And the other way that it affects kids is that so the the regions of their brains aren't developing correctly. Yeah. But then simultaneously, calcium is also important in the formation of myelin, mm -hmm. which is that protective sheath around the synapses between neurons. Yeah. So that's kind of like flimsy, which means that the neurons aren't firing efficiently. So not only do you have brain regions affected, but the communication between brain regions are affected too in little kids. And the upshot is, is that it, it promotes all sorts of problems with cognitive and, and emotional and behavioral development in, in children. Yeah. And like literally lower IQ scores. And we should say this, that's just like the most prominent, horrifying effect of lead. There's a whole laundry list of other things that can happen to you, like um, kidney failure, pain in your bones and joints from all that lead settling into where the calcium's supposed to go. Yeah, how about uh, decreased sex drive and sterility and infertility for both men and women? Uh, what else? Diarrhea? Lack of appetite, constipation. I think diarrhea is the least of your worries if you have a lead blood, poisoning. High blood pressure, enlarged heart. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it affects virtually every system in your body, basically. Yeah. And the reason why, again, is because it mimics or takes the place of calcium. And calcium is incredibly vital. It's an extremely important uh, mineral that you need found throughout your body. And if a leg goes in, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm here instead. Yeah. It's not going to do the stuff that the calcium is supposed to do, leading to all this cascade of horrific problems. Yeah, and one of the other scary things is that they, unless you have acute lead poisoning, you, you may not know. In fact, you probably won't know yeah. that you're being slowly poisoned, and you might just think, oh, I have diarrhea, uh, and I don't feel like having sex much anymore. Right. And you might be slowly getting lead poisoning. Yeah, and you, you just blame that on too many buffalo wings, but boom, <laughs> it's yeah. lead poisoning. It takes care of both. Sure. Uh, you remember being a kid and like lead pencils, like it was a big scare, like, you know, you got lead poisoning if you got poked with a pencil. Yeah, I remember that. But then I also remember learning that it's actually graphite used in pencils. Yeah, we, sh we should have. Well, a, by our age. We should have David Reese on. Oh, yeah. How to sharpen a pencil. Man, he can school you on some pencils. He wrote a whole book on it. Literally wrote the book on pencil sharpening. Yeah, I still have lead or I guess graphite somewhere in my hand Do you? from when I was jabbed very deep with a pencil that broke off. Wow. And it never left. And there's still just, it looks like a little black freckle. It's like you're in prison and got shanked. I know. I can't find where it is. So or maybe shivved. It, maybe it I see. It's away. right there. No, that's a scratch. Uh. <laughs> Good try. So we've talked about all the cognitive problems that can come about and behavioral and emotional disorders that, that can develop from lead. And this is like 
study after study after study has found this. It's one of the big reasons why there have been so many restrictions placed on lead exposure. Um, and recently, some people have, some researchers, including a couple, well, an, an economist, I believe, and an epidemiologist, have um, kind of taken that idea that lead can create all of these behavioral problems and any social behavioral problems. Um, and extrapolated to this idea that there is a big rise in cr the crime rate in the United States and actually around the world that followed about 20 years um, the same trajectory of the use of lead and gasoline. Yeah. A super interesting article, very controversial, like when it came, well, it still is. Sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's called Lead, America's Real Criminal Element. It was in Mother Jones. It was written by Kevin Drum, who's one of the all-time greats uh, working today. And um, I think I've mentioned it before, but I strongly encourage anybody. It doesn't even matter if lead's the most boring thing in the world to you. Go read this article. You will just be riveted by it. And Kevin Drum does a, a lot of he, – he does a very good job of – keeping his extrapolations down as low as possible. Although anybody can see by the evidence that he lays out that this is, it's pretty clear that lead is some sort of culprit in this. Um, and it's been shot down in that there's this idea that the, the science isn't settled. I suspect that it's the same mechanisms that force with climate denial. Like, oh, it's unsettled science doesn't prove anything. If you look at all the studies associated with this, yeah. the correlation between lead use in gasoline and therefore lead emissions in um, cars yeah. and criminal activity and its decline, again, it just follows it like 20 years after. And the whole yeah. idea is that when we started emitting lead into the atmosphere, um, kids started suffering these cognitive and antisocial behaviors. And then about 20 years after these kids were born, they started actually carrying out criminal activity. And we saw a tremendous rise in everything from like murder to rape to muggings to everything. Um, and it's, the, the article's too long to, to really go into detail. Again, just I strongly urge anybody to go read it. Yeah, the, the, um, the backlash that I've seen on the article wasn't to me like, it was all from scientists mainly. Yeah. I read a few of them. They weren't poo-pooing the notion. They said this, what this means is it bears a lot more investigation. Um, but as much as you want, if you can't replicate it, it's still possible confirmation bias or just sure. correlation and not causation. Like, could be a host of other issues that went into that. It could be. And, and Kevin Drum makes the same point. He's like, he there is also a, a rise in the uh, use of vinyl albums that followed roughly the same trajectory as well. But, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, of course it needs more study, for sure. Well, this this one scientist said what you really need to do is follow uh, what he calls a cohort study when you actually follow individuals right. along a long timeline. Yeah. Um, it's just a tough study. It's It, 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 it bears a lot of... Uh, to prove something like this just takes a lot more... Uh, data than they have. Right. And uh, I think the guy you're referencing is Scott Firestone, who is... Um, yeah, that was a good article, ...who too. wrote on the Discover Magazine blog. And, um, you know, he gives kudos to Drum, who definitely deserves it, for basically saying every time he says, you know, it's it's, it's so obvious. He caveats it. You'd have it. to be yeah. just, you know, have your head in the sand to, to deny this. He does say that, yes, speaking scientifically... It does require more study. Super but, interesting, though, because the crime and, and <clears throat> Drum followed it all over the world. He didn't just go to the United States and right. he saw the same thing in Canada and Australia and Great Britain. Yep. And um, the good news is, if if that is the case, then we should see crime dropping. For, well, we have forever. Yeah, but the problem is, is that it also should get us to do basically mitigate the lead that is in, around like in the soil and in the water and everywhere in people's houses um and the the dollar amounts that he estimates it would cost are pretty prohibitive at least as far as like the public will goes from right now but who knows i mean if enough science is done on it and you get the scientific community vocally speaking about this then maybe the public will will change yeah uh, if you do have lead poisoning, uh, you can get on meds. Uh, there's a prescription called uh, Susamer. 
S U C C I M E R. That was beautiful. Uh, uh, it's either that or suckamer. <laughs> I like how you said it. <laughs> um, it can reduce blood lead. Um, there are, of course, always side effects with every medication. Um, and if you work, if you've like, if there's been a disaster and you get toxic lead in your body very quickly, right. um, they can use something called uh, chelation. Collation. Collation therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when they use a collating agent. Uh, I'm not even going to try that. I'm going to call it that's EDTA. A, that's a, I'm going to try it, okay? Right. Ethylenediamine tetracetic acid. Hey, not bad. If you learn to say that like super quick. I missed the, the last A. That's just a few letters off from supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. I mean, yeah, it looks like the alphabet when it's on paper. <laughs> it but uh, we'll call it EDTA, and that's when it's infused into the bloodstream and actually binds. It basically says, lead, you're coming with me through yeah. the kidney out of your body. Right. Um, and But they use that when it's just an acute toxic dose um, that, that a person's been exposed to. Um, if a kid's been found to be poisoned with lead, actually, from what I read, one of the best treatments that um, they'll they'll carry out. There'll, there'll be other stuff too, depending on how bad it is. But a really good nutritious diet, um, getting the kid foods that are high in things like calcium and high in things like vitamin C that help the body absorb calcium so that they can go displace lead yeah. in the body. Because if you got lead and you got calcium fighting for the, for the same place, mm -hmm. if you can get the calcium in there, it's going to displace the lead and then hopefully leave the body Interesting. It's like, I'm going home. That's got to be hard on the kidney, so. I, I don't know. You know? I, I, yeah, I think if you have a, an acute lead poisoning or a serious lead poisoning, it's, it's not good. But yeah, of course it'd be hard on the kidneys because one of the things is kidney failure yeah, and anemia. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, if lead is, um, it, it, lead is definitely invariably in the ground and the groundwater and in the soil um, around us, and that's a problem. Because it sort of works its way up the food chain in a weird way, because what you have are these uh, tiny organisms. Um, it it gets in their body like plankton and microscopic plants, and they die, and then other things eat that their waste, right. and then it just sort of like bigger animals come along and keep eating these things. Yeah, it's not just humans that uh, suffer from lead toxicity; other animals too, even the small ones. So should we talk about these Flint lawsuits a little? Yeah. And then enchiladas, and that will fully... Yep. Will come Non-toxic enchiladas. <laughs> um, I guess it depends on who manufactured it. So I did some reading on the lawsuits. Right now, there's more than a dozen and probably growing. I'm sure. Uh, a few of them are class action suits on behalf of tens of thousands of Flint residents. And, you know, attorneys always lick their chops when they hear stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some concerns. One is that... The state of Michigan is like the city is broke, so don't even bother. Right. Uh, the state of Michigan may be an, a route to go if you want to get a lot of money, but then they say that'll just get pass, uh, passed along to the taxpayer. Yeah. Um, and a lot of experts in the legal world say that compensation is unlikely to begin with uh, as far as money goes uh, because of something, a couple of things. One thing called sovereign immunity which basically means the government can say, you know, giving water to the citizens is a core government function, so we're shielded legally from liability for doing that uh, improperly. So, like, you can't sue us. We're trying to give you water. Uh, and the other thing is specific causation has to be proved. So not only do you have to prove that the lead came from that water and not, like, the lead pipes in your house mm -hmm. or other, like, the lead paint in your walls maybe mm – -hmm. Uh, it has to come specifically from that Flint River water, right. uh, and you also have to prove that that directly led to the problem that your kid is having and not, you know, other things. Well, one of the things I read was that it is very possible that the lead came from the pipes in those people's houses, but that it's still on the provider of the water because they were supposed to be following uh, corrosion protection techniques that they lied about following they weren't following them, so it got rid of that protective coating that had been on the lead pipes before and was bringing all that lead into people's homes directly. So it may have been lead from the people's homes, but it was the corrosive nature of the terrible drinking water that yeah. was being pumped through those that caused that lead to be brought into the people's homes. And then again, on top of it, the uh, the government was lying about using the techniques that they were supposed to be using to prevent that from happening. So the, now that they've switched back over to Detroit, 
yeah. water, it's going to take a while for that protective film to develop on the pipes again. Right. So even now that the different water is coming through, it's still lousy with lead. Yeah. And the sad thing is that some people in Flint are too um, poor to do anything about it. Yeah. They still need water, so they're still drinking leaded water even though they know that it's going to hurt them down the line. Well, and it's sad that it sounds like uh, getting real compensation is maybe unlikely. Yeah, because a lot of these people who have kids, like if their kids suffer severe cognitive development problems, they're going to need help like the rest of their lives. Yeah, this one guy, uh, he's a law professor uh, specializing in environmental law named Noah Hall. He says what the probably the smart thing to do if you really want to help these people is set up, do what they did with the uh, Deepwater Horizon spill Mm -hmm. and set up a victim's compensation fund um, instead of doing it via lawsuit, like legislate it. Sure. Um, Maybe that would help. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. He basically said what the state shouldn't do is fight this. He's like, that would be big trouble. Uh, he said they should set up some sort of fund. So then they look like the good guys still, but then I think you don't get all the dirty details dragged out in public yeah. like you would with a lawsuit. Well, apparently they're already coming out anyway. Like troves of emails have yeah. been released. Um, the uh, the governor set up a task force to find out who was to blame, and they turned around and they were like, uh, you. Um, and he said, fire the task force. Right, exactly. <laughs> You're all fired. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's it's very scary. Man, Public health scare. Flint, uh, I know. talk about a city that's been roughed up over the years. I know. Well, we're there with you, Flint. Hang in there. If you want to learn more about lead or Flint or uh, criminal activity, you can check out all these different articles on the Internet, and you can type lead into the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com, and it'll bring up a pretty great article. Since I said pretty great article, it's time for a listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this Finland Rules. Uh, remember we did the Dark Money podcast, and I was like, what's a good place that's right. not corrupt? I remember. We heard from a lot of people um, in Scandinavia. Uh, hi, I'm an American living in Helsinki for the last few years with my Finnish husband. Um, Chuck, you were right on the money when you said there's very little uh, political corruption here. Of course, there's some, but uh, because they are humans after all, but the level compared to the states is laughable. When I asked my husband about it, he thought for a second and asked about uh, corruption scandals. He said a few years back... Uh, There was something about a prime minister who accepted lumber from a company to build his house. Huh. That was it. Uh, It seems comical to me considering the states in an an election year. Uh, Also, the campaign season is much shorter here, and it's done a little different. A party runs. There are at least five major parties. That's crazy in and of itself. Sure. Like crazy good. Yeah. Uh, A party runs, and whichever gets a majority elects from its ranks, the prime minister, and makes a cabinet out of a coalition of the other parties, which receive high numbers of votes. How about that? Like, you came in second, you're on board, too. Amazing. Come on. <laughs> and here's your participant ribbon. Uh, campaigns are paid for by disclosed donations and public funds. Uh, you also made a comment about the high taxes here. Uh, many people, usually Americans, say that uh, with distaste that the taxes are so high here, but I've come to think very highly of it. I've discovered that I don't really need another pair of jeans or a new jacket. What I need is an educated society around me and access to quality health care a truly equal society where everyone is safe and has their basic needs met. Uh, that is from Gabrielle. Wow. A lot of people hate your guts for saying that, Gabrielle. <laughs> <laughs> that was so brave of you. Thanks, Gabrielle, for writing in. Um, uh, I don't know how they say adios in Finland. No, she's American. Well, goodbye. Okay. Thank you for writing in. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. You can send us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. And as always, join us on the web at stuffyoushouldknow.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.